Okay, in this video I'm going to go through how a CAT scanner works. Um, so by the end of today you're going to understand how a CAT scanner uses X-ray images, sorry, X-rays, not X-ray images, uses X-rays to produce slices or images. So by the end of this video you should all understand the principles behind CAT scanning and you should be able to duplicate uh, something called an 8 voxel cube image. You should also be able to compare and contrast X-rays with CT, with, sorry, compare and contrast simple X-rays with CAT scans, giving advantages of each type. Uh, and you should be able to explain why CAT scanning is slowly being replaced uh, by MRI scanning, possibly. Um, or you might be able to start realizing why that is. Okay, so let's just think about why we need CAT scans in the first place. Here's a guy, he's had a massive head injury, so potentially damage to the brain, potentially damage to the skull. So what they're going to do is stick him in one of these devices. This is a CAT scanner. Um, what we have is inside the CAT scanner, there's an X-ray tube. And on the opposite side of that, there is a detector. And that X-ray tube rotates around the patient as does the detector. So they're always on opposite sides of each other and they send x-rays through first in one direction, then in the other, then in the next, all the while through the center of uh, whichever body part they want to image. Now why do they bother doing that? Well, a traditional x-ray gives you an image that looks like this. Um, so this will be great for detecting any damage to the skull because we will see any cracks in his skull or jaw, but it's not so great for looking at his brain. This on the right is an MR, sorry, is a CAT scan. So this is an X-ray. This is a CAT scan. They both use X-rays, but an X-ray is obviously a simple photographic plate. This is a CAT scan. Now you can obviously see that there's a lot more detail here. Particularly, you can see all the details of his brain. Um, and these images are really fascinating. Um, you can see certainly uh, the gaps around the brain. So uh, one of the things that you often see in head injuries is this area starts to bleed, um, or a certain area starts to bleed, and you see a bulge um, that shouldn't be there where blood is pressing on the brain. So there's a really useful diagnostic tools for checking if there's been any injuries. So what does the CAT scan look like? Um, this would be a video representation. Um, more often than not, this is what the doctor sees. Uh, so this is a photographic plate, and each image is called a slice. And these slices, these are starting, uh, you can see the eyes there. Um, so those are the patient's eyeballs, um, then you can see some structure at the top of the head, and then this is the deep inside the brain now. Um, so you're seeing uh, horizontal slices out from the uh, from about the uh, bottom, top of the jaw, all the way up to the top of the skull. Um, so you're getting a, a three-dimensional picture of the inside of the patient's head. So let's just think about the uh, name of this. Uh, first of all, we call it, we actually call it computerized axial tomography. CAT scanning, that's what it stands for. Uh, the tomography comes from the Greek word tomos, which means a slice. And you should be able to see now where that comes from. We're seeing slices of inside the patient's head. The axial part comes from how we actually form the images. So the images are formed on an axis with the X-ray tube at the top detector at the bottom and it moves around the patient collecting um, a bunch of uh, detections from different angles. The computerized part uh, is a little bit more complicated to explain um, but basically um, what we're going to end up with is uh, a series of, uh, of bits of information about how much how many x-rays or the intensity of x-rays detected at each part around the patient and we need to use that to reconstruct what the inside of the patient looks like and that's a very complicated process um, this equation that you see at the bottom here is the generalized form of it um, and it's a beast 
it would take months and months and months working with pen and paper um, to recreate one of the images that you see here. Um, so it's not really practical to do it by hand. Instead, we have to use a computer to speed things up. So let's think about how we actually build an image. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to, like physicists love to do, we're going to make things simpler than they really are. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a slice of the patient's head, and we want to see this slice here. So you can always imagine it like we've got a piece of wire, cut the top of the head off, and then cut an inch down. But our method is going to be a little bit less destructive. So what we can see here is the inside of the patient's brain. That's the slice that we want to get. Now what we do is we break that slice up into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little cubes. Um, just a little um, bit of uh, nomenclature for you. A pixel is what we call a two-dimensional area of space. A voxel is what we call a three-dimensional area of space. So each of these little cubes is a voxel. There's voxel 1, there's voxel 2, there's voxel 3. And you can see that to look at a patient, we're going to need hundreds of thousands or even millions of voxels. Um, the smaller our voxels, the greater the resolution. So when you're looking at things like small bleeds in the brain, you really want the highest resolution possible. Now, what are we actually going to get? What we're going to receive is some information about our x-rays. So here is my x-ray tube again. And I'm going to fire very tightly collimated beams of x-rays through my patient. This is the patient here. Yeah, so, I can, so I can represent the patient as a region of space. Now, what I'm going to detect over here is a graph of intensity against position. So I can see that the intensity here is high. Whereas the intensity over here is low. And that kind of makes sense, because if you look through it this way, this path here has to go through a lot of the patient. Um, so, the, although it says intensity, it's kind of absorption. So the amount of absorption is high over here, um, whereas in this line, it only has to go through a very small amount of patient, so I have a low absorption. The clever bit comes from then rotating. So I then move my x-ray tube over here, and I send it through the patient in a different direction. When I do it in a different direction, my intensity graph will now look quite different. They'll have a different form. So what I can do is use this series of different intensities of different angles to reconstruct how what the density of the patient must be inside. And it's a very complicated process, but I'm going to break it down a little bit simpler. So over here, I've got a really simple patient. We can represent him as just some flesh, a lung, a heart, another lung, and a bit of spine. Now, let's think about the amount of x-ray absorption. X-ray absorption will be quite high in the heart. It will be really, really low in the lungs. It'll be super duper high in the spine. And it will be kind of average all over the body. Now, if I think about the patient in terms of voxels, that means that these ones around here, these cubes, will have low intensity in them. Um, and then I'll have a region in the patient of uh, lower intensity. And then I'll have the heart, which is medium intensity here. So it's these actual individual voxels, sorry, yeah, individual voxels that will have changing values of attenuation coefficient. And if you remember back, uh, we call mu the 
attenuation coefficient. And the more something absorbs x-rays, the higher its attenuation coefficient. So I'm taking a patient, instead of thinking of them in terms of lungs and hearts, I'm thinking of them in terms of regions of space that have different attenuation coefficients. And what I want to do is reconstruct an image based off of that. So what I can do is fire some x-rays through my patient. And this is just going to show you three beams. Obviously, in the real thing, you have lots more. So I record over here the intensity of the incoming x-rays. And then um, we do a little bit of signal processing, and we get these as attenuation coefficients. So we can say that there's attenuation coefficient through this angle. When I fire a beam this way, I get attenuation coefficient of 6. When I fire it through this way, I get one of 10. When I fire it through this way, I get one of 8. Then what I do is rotate my x-ray beam, rotate my detector, and I get a set of three new attenuation coefficients. So I can say that when I fire a beam through this line in the patient, I now get these values in different locations. So, what I've got to do is go from this big bunch of data to an image of the patient. And I'm going to show you one way of doing it. Now, this way I've got to highlight to you, this is super simple. It's not very useful in the real world, but it just gives you a rough idea of the sort of algorithm that these things use. So, I start off with some voxels with different densities. Um, so, this is going to be my patient. So I might have, for example, this has a high attenuation coefficient here, so this could be bone, this is very low, so this could be lung, um, this is quite high, so this could be heart, dense muscle, and this could just be some flesh or fat. Yeah, that's kind of the idea of how the patient would look. Obviously, in the real thing, we have a heck of a lot more. So the first thing I'm going to do is fire my x-rays through the side, and I'm going to record my effective attenuation coefficient. So this x-ray from the top here has gone through a 6 and a 5, so its total attenuation will be 11. This bottom x-ray has gone through an 8 and a 2, so its total attenuation coefficient will be a 10. Now what I can do is I can construct my own voxels with that. That 10 is going to go straight, sorry, that 11 is going to go straight across there, so I'll get 11 in both the top boxes, and the 10 will go straight across like that, so I'll get 10 in both those boxes. To make a bit more sense in a second. And what I can then do is I can add those to my computer memory and say, so far, my patient looks like this. Now you can see this is um, kind of true. If you look, this top line of the patient is greater absorption than the bottom line, but it's not looking very, it's not getting these fine details. So what I can do now is rotate my x-ray emitter and my detector, and I'm now going to fire it through an angle. And when I fire it through an angle, I can say, right, well, I'll take this 5, and that will only go through there, so that becomes that. This x-ray beam, however, goes through a 6 and a 2, so it has a total attenuation coefficient of 8. This bottom one only goes through that one, so it becomes, oops, excuse me, so that also becomes 8. Now, what I can then do is add that to my computer as well. So this 5 goes through that top bit, so that becomes 5. This 8 will go through both of these boxes, so both of these become 8. This 8 will just go through there, so that becomes 8. And now what I do is I add that to my computer memory too. So 11 plus 5 is 16, 11 plus 8 is 19, 10 plus 8 is 18, and 10 plus 8 is 18. So again, this is starting to look um, a little bit more like my patient. Can you see that um, still my top line is showing as more dense than my bottom line? And also, I'm starting to get some differentiation between these two. I'm showing that this region is more dense to x-rays um, than the region next door to it, which is true. I still haven't, I still got something really weird going on down here, but I'm starting to get a more realistic picture. So let's take some more image. Um, this, remember, up here is my memory. 
And this over here is my patient. So let's give him another blast of radiation. And um, this time I'm going to go from the top. So 5 add 2 gives me 7. 6 add 8 gives me 14. That goes straight into my computer memory. So the 7 drops into both of these boxes. The 7 the 14 drops into both of these boxes. And again, I add this on to my computer memory. So 16 add 7 is 23. 19 add 14 is 30. 3, uh, 18 add 7 is 25, and 18 add 14 is 32. Now again, I'm starting to, st I'm still um, not quite there yet, but I've still got some differentiation in my, in my patterns. So I'll give it one more blast of radiation. Again, this one's going to go through there, so the 6 just got, drops into that box. This one has attenuation coefficient of 5 add 8, uh, so that's 13, and this one gets the 2. And again, the 2 is going to, sorry, the 6 is going to go through like that, so I get the 6 there. The 13 is going to go that way, so I get 13 in each of these, and the 2 is going to go in there. I'm going to add it onto my computer memory again, and I get 36, 39, 27, and 45. Now, in total, the four voxels in my patient adds up to 21. So, so I can call that the background. So the first thing I can do is subtract my background from the patient. So uh, what I end up with is subtracting 21 from each value, I get 15, 18, 6, and 24. And now this looks exactly like my patient. Um, what I can also do is I can say I took uh, four images. So if I divide it by three to get n minus one, so the average of a single image, well now that gives me five, six, two, and eight. So I've reconstructed my patient's absorption coefficients from a series of bits of information of the absorption at different angles. Now in reality, um, we get 3D images from CT using an n by n by n voxel cube. So we have lots and lots of, of cubes, possibly thousands in each direction. We've just done a two by two and we could add on an extra set behind to get the eight voxel cubes. So in the exam, they might ask you to do this process twice. Um, once for the first kind of uh, slice, and then again for the next slice. And that would give you eight voxel cubes in total. You could be asked to recreate that. Now, this algorithm works for two by two by two. It doesn't work for anything else. For anything else, you have to use this horrible equation. and. 3x3x3 three by three by three is probably doable on pen and paper with the maths that you know, if you don't mind doing lots and lots of calculus. Um, when you get into the tens of cubes, it's not really something that any mathematician could reasonably do on paper. Um, to get a, a realistic image, you have to do a computer just because it's, it's, it's quicker. Um, now, um, we need to think about some advantages and disadvantages then of uh, CT scans. Uh, the advantages, I hope, are pretty clear now. Um, you get slices through the patient. Um, it can also differentiate very well um, between different types of tissues. That's something that x-rays can't really do. Um, you kind of just get bone or tissue. You, do, you can tell a little bit, but not easily. Um, FC, uh, CAT scans can do it really, really well. Um, the main disadvantage is you have a higher radiation dose. Uh, obviously, you're, t you're exposing the patient to lots and lots of sets of uh, x-ray images and you know, from different angles. So the dose is much higher. However, um, if you remember back to when we talked about uh, the improving uh, x-rays, there are there happen a lot of advances now with technology that means that the dose can be lower, um, but it's still something to consider. Um, the other main disadvantage is the cost. 
you have to have a lot of computing power, um, which is becoming a lot cheaper these days, so it's not the biggest problem, um, but still the devices are complex, they need maintenance, um, so they are considerably more expensive than a classic X-ray. Um, in the next lesson, um, we're going to think about ultrasound, um, which uses no ionizing radiation. Um, so we may think about some of the advantages of that. And then we're going to finish up by thinking about MRI. MRI is probably the most advanced imaging technique that we currently have. Um, it's considerably more complex even than uh, computerized axial tomography. Um, it has none of the ionizing radiation either, but it's also um, the most expensive type. So we'll think about uh, some of the reasons why MRI scans are becoming more and more popular uh, in two lessons time. As always, if you have any questions, then uh, if they're urgent, feel free to email them to me. Uh, if not, then I will see you in the lesson when we can go through any bits that don't quite make sense. If you could fill out uh, your flipped learning booklet about this, that would be fantastic, and I will look forward to seeing you in the lesson. Thank you very much for watching.